Good morning, everyone. Pastor Mark Kinsley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs. I want to welcome you and let us know where you're from, how we can pray for you, and just know that we're honored that you're watching today. Share this with your friends. That's how you partner with us in proclaiming the gospel. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for today, for this Christmas season, for the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Pray that you'd anoint us and use us to point people to your throne, to your heart, to your forgiveness. Bless everyone watching today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You're looking at a picture of Tokyo, Japan. You'd be interested to know that Tokyo and uh, most of Japan and of course many parts of the world celebrate Christmas similarly to how we celebrate Christmas in America. In fact, I was reading that a television interviewer was walking the streets of Tokyo at Christmas time. And much as in America, uh, Christmas means different things to different people. So this interviewer stopped a young woman on the sidewalk and asked her this question, what is the meaning of Christmas? Laughingly, she replied, I don't know. Is that the day that Jesus died? There was some truth in her answer. Celebrated American novelist E.B. White, you'll know him for writing Stuart Little and Charlotte's Web, said this once, to perceive Christmas through its wrappings becomes more difficult every year. For many people, Christmas is a tough time of year. Maybe they are facing too much month, not enough money, and they can't really participate in the giving of gifts. Sometimes Christmas makes us feel isolated and lonely and dejected. Maybe you're far away from family and, or family is um, just not interested in your story. Folks face difficult, different experiences during Christmas. And we feel the weight of it sometimes. And there are many reactions to Christmas. Some people have the Christmas spirit in the truest sense of the word. They realize it's about a baby born in a Bethlehem stable 2,000 years ago. And so they are focused on the incarnate Christ and how he wants to change a human life. Others, far too many others, are busy stuffing stockings and filling wish lists, decorating their homes without a real comprehension or understanding of the significance of Christmas. Today, in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, you're going to see different attitudes that were displayed 2,000 years ago. And if we peer close enough, intently enough, we can see sometimes modern-day attitudes in the way that people responded to Christmas so long ago. <clears throat> You'll notice that Christmas, for us, always will mean that it's God becoming a man, one of us, to save us. His birth says many things to many people, and we notice that today under the title, What Does Christmas Mean to You? In the book of Matthew today, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it arose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, 
Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. After being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The title today, What Does Christmas Mean to You? For some, they will be troubled at Christmas. Maybe that's you. Other people might be somewhat indifferent at Christmas. They've seen so many come and go, and they've become quite uh, repulsed by the commercialization of Christmas. Maybe that's how you feel today, but there are some, thankfully some, that are true worshipers at Christmas. And we'll see these attitudes in the text today. So notice, first of all, you may be troubled at Christmas. Herod was troubled at Christmas. His response when the Magi's came and asking about a star was immediate upheaval. In fact, all of Jerusalem would be disrupted by his attitude. What you'll find really interesting about Herod is of all the people, all the personages, all the personalities that circle the birth experience of our Lord Jesus Christ, King Herod probably understood best what his coming meant. You say, how could that godless despot understand what it really meant? Because he knew that the coming of the Lord Jesus was a threat to his own personal kingdom, his own personal rule, and he took it as an offense. And he was wise in that in the sense that he realized when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came to change this world, to offer freedom to all who would believe, but make no make mistake about it, the Lord Jesus Christ is a change agent. Herod understood it unbelievably better than most. And so when you read this part of the section... The Bible says when Herod heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. It was troubling because he saw Jesus as a potential rival to his throne. And he hears the phrase king of the Jews and he thinks to himself, well, that's my title. I'm king of the Jews. So to hear the statement from the Magi, wise men from the east, that there was a new king coming into focus was exceedingly unsettling to Herod. It stuck, struck a chord of fear, I have no doubt, in his heart. And I'm wondering something today. Are you troubled at Christmas? You say, Pastor, how so? I'm, I'm talking about the implications of it. Moving past the baby in a manger into the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The life that was lived vicariously, with courage, with valor, the, the one who would die for us on the cross, who would be tempted in all ways like we are yet without sin, the one that Paul wrote about, who was rich but for our sakes became poor, that we who are poor might become rich. We see and look back to Jesus in the manger, meek and mild, cooing under the swaddling clothes, being fed and loved by his mother Mary. That's not a startling image, but when you see Jesus Christ risen from the dead, triumphant, living king, it's an altogether different assessment. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to have all of you, every part of your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life, the Lord of your thoughts, the Lord of your finances, the Lord of your ambitions, the Lord of your life. Vance Havner once said, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. The point is, he is Lord of all. And you can't escape the uh, absolute intense life of Jesus. He is not Jesus meek and mild. He is the sun-crowned King of kings and the Lord of lords. And soon coming King, where he will rule from Jerusalem with an iron scepter. So many people, when they really understand the person of Jesus Christ are troubled because the Bible's very clear, very clear that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He will have, has now, all authority that's been given to him on heaven and earth. And he expects 
total allegiance. Those who respond to him by faith and repentance are saved and they're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. But folks, listen, those who reject him will one day face his wrath in judgment. And folks, facing the wrath of Almighty God, the Bible says it is a serious, fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And when God adjudicates sin by damning people to hell for rejecting him, that is a sobering thought and one you don't hear much at Christmas time. But you should. So are you troubled at the thought of Christmas? Many were in our Lord's day. Many are today. You don't have to be. He came into his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, you can be saved, forgiven, redeemed. Have him capture your life and the future of your life in his hands. What a secure place that is. Notice something else about this time of year. People have different opinions. Some people are troubled at Christmas. There's a whole lot of folks, listen to me, who are indifferent at Christmas. <coughs> Pardon me, the religious leaders were. When Herod heard the statement about these magi who had seen a star, the scripture says in verse 4 that he assembled the chief priests and scribes of the people and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. In other words, all the religious leaders and mystics and wise uh, people who were somewhat as counselors to Herod uh, um, are brought into his chambers, brought into the throne room. And he begins to ask them, what's going on? What is this about? And those men were wise enough, astute enough to know the prophecies of the Old Testament. And they were aware that a king would come. But what's so fascinating about it to me is they don't seem to have an interest in it. It's only when they're called to tell him that they even speak about it. Maybe they were afraid to face Herod and his rampaging attitude and anger at the thought of someone usurping his authority. But for whatever reason, religious leaders who understood the significance of the Magi seem to be indifferent to it and some of them quite honestly might have wanted to travel with the magi but you don't see that they did they just stayed home and it's sad to me when there's an indifference to the greatest news in all the world that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned. Without faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no possibility, my dear friend, that you will ever see heaven, that you'll ever see God. I can't encourage you enough to repent, therefore, and be converted, that the times of refreshing might come, that your sins would be forgiven, that you would know him. The greatest gift you can receive this Christmas isn't found at the mall. It's not on discounted Dillard's. It's in humbling yourself before God, turning from sin, trusting Christ, and asking him to take over the reins of your life. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me, Paul said, and the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The greatest experience of my life was as a teenager in North Carolina, when I knelt at an altar and trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. I've never regretted one moment of giving my life to him, and you won't either. But make no mistake about it, a lot of people have heard the story so many times told, <coughs> pardon me, in so many ways that they feel like they have the inside track and it just doesn't move them anymore. Don't ever get so familiar with the greatest expression of love that you neglect to embrace it with joy 
and let, uh, let your face know it, that you've been saved. Watch the world needs to see that he is who he said he was. Christmas is the greatest good news that men and women could ever hear. When the angels spoke to the shepherds in the field, they were declaring the most exciting event that had happened in history up to that point, only to be succeeded by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So it's sad that some people are indifferent and even check out at Christmas time. They just don't have the Christmas spirit. But folks, listen to me. The Christmas spirit is Christ. Without Christ, you have no Christmas. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no genuine Christmas spirit. Have you given your life to him? You can. You say, Pastor, what do I need to do? You need to admit that you've sinned. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Do you know the Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God? Listen to me carefully. I would not trust the best 15 minutes of my life to get me to heaven. You have to admit that you've sinned. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has sons and daughters. You can get to heaven on the faith of your grandparents, provided it is personal, intimate, and genuine in your own human experience. We have to admit that we've sinned. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says we need to confess. If you will confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus up from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen to me. Whether or not this is a hard candy Christmas for you or not, whether or not you're far away from family or family is distant to you because of some ruptured relationship, I want you to know something. God loves you deeply. And he sent his son as a proof of that. And he wants you to experience the greatest gift the human heart could ever know. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And if you're thinking about that, considering that, call me here at the church. Let me know. I'd be happy to come to your house. But listen to me, folks. Don't end Christmas, this Christmas season, outside of the will of God. And God's will for you is that you be saved. And so you see these attitudes replete 2,000 years ago, common today in the world that we live in. And so you notice you may, and I pray this is you, be a worshiper at Christmas. Do you see it in the passage? Verse 11 in the passage is accumulation of a long process of seeking. The Magi, or wise men, is a better definition, had somehow learned of the Lord's coming, and they're on their way to meet him. It moved them deeply. They really were wise. Their priorities were in proper order. They had traveled a great distance, perhaps even as long as a year or two, to seek out the coming Messiah. And when they found him, verse 11 says, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and myrrh. You know, they arrived one to two years after the birth of Jesus. We know that because when they go into the home, uh, he's uh, a child. He's not a baby anymore. He's a toddler. And it's a humble place, I'm sure, in Nazareth. And we don't know how many magi there were. We don't know that they were kings. A lot of things get placed into the Christmas story. A lot of times you'll see those magi right there around the manger. Well, like one pastor said, if they were there the night Jesus was born, they had had to ride jet-propelled camels because they didn't arrive for a year or two later. But they come in. The quest finds its completion in a humble home in Nazareth. And however many there were, they came to worship. By the way, people think there were three because of the three gifts mentioned they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, because the Magi were coming to hail the new king. Gold makes sense in the acknowledgement of royalty. Gold was valuable then. Gold is valuable now, beautiful and long-lasting. Many scholars 
<clears throat> agree that the gift of gold represented Jesus as a king with an everlasting throne. It was a treasure befitting royalty, albeit royalty in the day, home of a young, poor family. And then they give him the gift of frankincense. The gift of frankincense is said to have been an acknowledgement of Jesus' priesthood, setting him apart from a typical king. Frankincense was used in temple rituals, burned ceremoniously by the priest. It was not native to the region of Nazareth, however. So obtaining frankincense from the east was costly. This gift was precious in both meaning and value. And then, not only gold, not only frankincense, but myrrh. That's a bittersweet gift. Myrrh had been imported to Egypt in droves for embalming rituals, and the practice filtered out through the surrounding areas, even Without the mummification process, myrrh was corrected, or connected, I should say, with death and burial. A disheartening gift, someone wrote, for a new mother to hold, yet beautiful in light of her understanding of his purpose. So it pointed to how he would offer his life as a ransom one day for many. He's offered his life. For you, When they found the Lord, when they found him, they worshipped him. You can be a worshiper too. But to be a worshiper, you have to turn from sin, repent of sin, reject fear, reject apathy, reject indifference towards the true meaning of Christmas. Be willing to be like the Lord Jesus Christ of all things in this world of all places. Just as the wise men were willing to leave the relative safety of their own home and journey to a far land to bring gifts to someone they'd never even met, I challenge you to give of your life, your energy, your talents, your finances, your hopes, your futures, your aspirations, and lay them at the feet of the Lord and say, lead on, O King Eternal. I tell you, the best thing you and I can do is take a blank sheet of paper, write our name at the bottom and say, Lord, Fill in the details, I am all in to my last breath. We must seek him with our whole heart. When we do, we are worshipers. And God will not reject us when we come to him with that kind of bold faith, that tender resignation to the fact that he is God alone. And I cannot live another moment without recognizing him as the sovereign king over my life. I want to know him. The bottom line is this, folks, the greatest gift we could ever present him would be the gift of ourselves. You see, when we give ourselves, we've given him everything else because it comes together and you don't hold anything back. And he will have us and we will have him. And that's what he desires for all of us to be a true worshiper of Christmas means that we present ourselves to him and we become his. The greatest treasure any of us really has is the treasure of ourselves. Like us, the wise men, if they're wise and if we're wise, give our treasures up to him and offer him the precious things of our lives. I read of a little boy who was in a worship service and the offering came by and he dug into his pocket and he had what little boys have in their pockets, which maybe not perfect for an offering experience. And so he took out a little piece of paper and he wrote down, I give myself. And he put that in the offering plate and I would state to you that that little guy gave the best gift in that church that day. I encourage you, as I encourage myself, to give my life afresh to the Lord day by day, moment by moment. I give myself to you not troubled at christmas not indifferent but a worshiper at christmas what does christmas mean to you father i thank you for today i thank you for speaking through this text to our hearts in these troubled times and may we not be troubled or indifferent but truly worshiping you in anticipation that the God, who sent his son, will send him yet again to come and rapture the church to be with him. And I pray that everyone listening to this message this day, and whenever they listen to it, 
have surrendered their lives to you, have trusted you, repented of sin, and invited Christ to take over the direction of their lives. And I pray that for everyone watching. I pray that I will see them one day in your forever kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in beautiful Colorado Springs. Hoping you have a great rest of the day and a great upcoming Christmas week. And remember, he is the reason for the season. Have a good afternoon, folks. Mm -hmm.